Hey, welcome to Kotlin Conversations. We're here, we're here at, at Kotlin Conf 2023, having conversations with just some of the amazing speakers here. And I am Gwen Dow, and I'm speaking with... Christina Lee. Hi, Christina. Hi, Gwen. I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm here with my very, very good friend, Christina Lee. Uh, Christina, I know these answers, but I would like to ask you for the audience, uh, what do you do and where are you based and how did you get started in Kotlin? Yeah, I am a software engineer who focuses on Android and I work at Pinterest in San Francisco. In terms of getting started, I mean, we, we have shared a long Kotlin journey together, so you probably know this, but I first adopted Kotlin when I was at a very small startup. And on my first day of the job, when I came in, one of my coworkers said, there's a language and we should use it. And he kept saying the word Kotlin, but I had never heard it before and didn't know how to spell it. So that night I went home and desperately tried to Google it because I didn't want to look silly. And so I was like trying all of these, these permutations, just not understanding quite what word he had been saying. And finally the next day at work, they wrote it on the whiteboard and said Kotlin. And I was like, okay, Kotlin, we're, we're going to go forward with this. And so I went home, I started studying it. We wrote the, the whole Android app in Kotlin back when it was way pre pre 1.0 and the rest is history. Yeah, and I guess just for a little extra flavor, the first person that I, the first time I ever saw Kotlin was at DroidCon SF That's 2016. Right. And Christina was giving a talk. And again, this was at least a year before yeah. official Google Android support, or sorry, Google Android support of Kotlin. So I, I think it's fair to say that there were still a lot of people like myself who had no idea what Kotlin was. And I was with a, a colleague of mine at the time and he said, oh, that's Kotlin. I'm like, what's Kotlin? And you wrote all your code samples in Kotlin. Yeah, and the funny thing about that was that I didn't even realize that was abnormal because we had been writing in Kotlin for so long and I hadn't worked on Android in any other company. And so that's the only way I had had experienced Android at the startup was that we we were writing Kotlin from day one. And so when I put up my slides, I just was putting up snippets in, in the way that I knew to write Android. And then after that talk, nobody commented on the content of the talk. I couldn't even tell you what it was, but everybody came up and they said, are you using Kotlin? What is that like? What is that language? Uh, how is it doing? And, and so I was so caught off guard because I had no idea when I made those slides that it would garner so much interest from people at DroidCon. I do remember it was Redux, but... Thank you! Yeah, okay, that so, is right. <laughs> I do remember that. That is right. But, but I was struck by Kotlin, and um, again, for a little more personal flavor, I think when I first started using Kotlin, which was November, so that, I think that was about March, and so yeah. about eight months later, I started using Kotlin, and Christina was the first person that I DM'd, like, I just made an interface in Kotlin, isn't this amazing? So um, I, I, I feel like very personally like that my Kotlin journey is very tied to you <laughs> yeah. as well, um, and you've been such an outspoken advocate for Kotlin for a long time. You, for example, gave a talk at Google I.O. 2017? 2017. 2017. I know. Um, and it was about adoption, which I think yeah. is um, kind of uh, is a good segue to talking about what you're talking about now. So, I mean, you've been an advocate for Kotlin for a long time. Mm -hmm. And something that's really interesting, of course, we're not going to shut up about it <laughs> anytime soon in, in terms of Android developers, is the modern Android uh UI toolkit, which is written all in Kotlin, and that is what you spoke about this time around. Um, can you tell a little, a little bit about, I guess, generally what your talk was about and why you wrote it? Yeah, so the talk that I gave at KotlinConf this year was about the adoption of Compose in our company, or rather the attempt to adopt Compose in our company that did not go the way I thought it would go. It is not the type of talk I was hoping to give. I was hoping that we would adopt Compose, everything would go perfectly, and we would be off to the races. And unfortunately, sometimes that doesn't happen. And so I at least wanted other people to be able to learn from some of the mistakes that we made and some of the takeaways that we had. And so the premise of the talk was basically a public postmortem of how we tried to bring Compose into our code base and some of the, the learnings that we had from what went wrong with that. I think it's a really interesting, I guess, um, like mirror image or I guess dichotomy between, it really is. you know, I, I think with Kotlin, we all, you know, when back 2016, 2017, I think in a similar way, we, there was a lot of positive buzz, like, you know, mostly people were just talking about all the fun stuff that you could do, how easy it was, oh, the interrupt is great. And I don't think it's unfair to say that, that we've heard, we've heard a lot of like similar, like 
surprised good buzz around Compose. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean always that, you know, if everyone's having a good time, you're going to have a good time too. Yeah. Can you just kind of start with like what, what were like the initial challenges with adopting Compose? Yeah, uh, I mean, there were there were some challenges that were pretty easy to overcome. We had some issues with the compiler at first because it was early on. We were trying to adopt Compose pre 1.0, again, early technology. Mm -hmm, yeah. We had a few crash issues early on as well, but again, easy to overcome. Where we really got bogged down was in the performance of Compose. Mm -hmm. And our application is very performance sensitive because of what we do. Um, if, if you have a high intent user for something like sending money or, or moving a person like via a ride share or something, even if your app is slow, they still need to pay for the item. They still need to go to the place that they want to go. So they're much more uh, they're much more able to withstand slowdowns and app performance and continue to use that app. But with a Pinterest app, when people are often pulling it out, uh, they they can find inspiration at a different time. Like they do not need to plan their birthday party right in that moment. They do not need to look uh, new designs for their kitchen right in that moment. And so if we give them a slow app experience, they just abandon it. And unfortunately, when we integrated Compose, we were finding that we could not get the performance even kind of in the ballpark of what we had with views. So um, I mean, it's um, that makes a lot of sense, and I like that 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 distinction that you drew between something that is I don't I have to say, it's such an engineering but like mission critical for that person yeah. or just a priority for that person right now, where something is more optional or kind of just a an add on to their current experience. Yeah. So obviously, you have to be on your game more in in, in many ways more than I guess a essential app. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to call it that, but you know, just something that someone is, is, is actually needing right now as opposed to being, as you said, inspired and wanting to kind of use yep. your tool. Um, I mean, was it an issue of just that, I mean, obviously you've, uh, Pinterest has been around for quite a while and you already have an established code base. Was Did that play a big factor into adoption and, and some of the issues you were running into? Yeah, absolutely, but in, in surprising ways. So the interop story between Compose and Views was, was quite well taken care of. We, we had a few hiccups and again they were mostly due to the age of our code base. We had done things in a slightly um, unusual way and, and so the interop we had to go and smooth it out but it really wasn't much of a problem. Where I think that legacy code base comes in is similar to the situation between views and compose. When you've had a code base for 10 years you've been optimizing it that whole time. It turns out it's really 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 fast yeah. and so our home feed actually doesn't even use um, views. It uses custom drawables mm -hmm. and so even when we ran a follow-on experiment just to put views in our home feed there was a quite significant performance regression because the way we had taken care of that home feed over the past many years 10 years of that app is that we had we had slowly done all of these micro optimizations and so that accumulated over time and then when you come in with a new technology that isn't at that level um, there's some catching up to do I, I, and I think that's something that a lot of times, again, when new things come in and we're adopting them, we kind of lose a little bit because all, often the story is about, hey, look at this cool thing and look, you can start an app or start a, you know, start your um, software and this, this, and this is just going to line up and it's going to be awesome. But as you said, you spent years and, and yeah. it sounds like very complex, very particular ways of doing things to get yeah. it right. And I mean, ultimately keeping that you know, performance and keeping that high level of quality is the most important thing. But um, in terms of like, and, and, and but the thing is, is that um, Google has said, this is the way forward, this is the modern Absolutely. way. So how did you as a company, you know, from a product perspective and ultimately from an engineering perspective, deal with that tension of, okay, we're going to eventually probably have to do this, Yep. but everything works great right now. Like, how, how do you um, kind of communicate that, you know, plan for that, like, you know, solve that problem? It's entirely. a great question. And so this was one of our concerns because we are very excited about Compose and very sad that we couldn't make the case to adopt it and, and do a full-fledged adoption immediately. That was what we had wanted. We sunk a lot of time into getting to that resolution. So it was, it was quite sad for us to, to make the determination that this particular point in time was not the right one to move uh, forward with full support. But we also, as, as you said, are very aware that this is the future of Android. And so the way that we're trying to balance those two things is that we have committed to revisiting the experiments that gather metrics on our Compose integration every quarter or every Compose release, whichever comes first. Basically, anytime there is a change, we're going to rerun the experiments, regather the data, and, and see if now it's at a point where we can make the business case to move forward. And then 
acknowledging that sometimes you just can't get to complete neutrality, we also have an exploding deadline that we have set internally. And we said that even if we cannot get metrics neutrality, if this amount of time passes, we're going to re-baseline, we're going to adopt Compose, we're going to move forward because we want to avoid unnecessary risk, but we don't want to be paralyzed with an action. How do you even determine a deadline like that? Like, I mean, is it, is it, I mean, obviously, as, an, as engineers, deadlines are very hard, yes. they're usually guesses, but I mean, in terms of that kind of deadline where, how do you, how do you even begin to set that? I think it'd be interesting. To be honest, it is, it is arbitrary. Like, <laughs> that's like, first and foremost, it is arbitrary. But Google had been very clear that in the first version of Compose, they were working towards uh, having features, full-fledged features, mm -hmm. and they weren't yet going to shift into performance tuning mode until after that 1.0 was released, and then they would look at some of those performance concerns. And we're seeing that as Compose comes out with 1.3 and 1.4, with all the modifier refactors. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. from our point of view, we knew that the, the 1.0 might not work for us, <clears throat> but they were going to quickly follow on with performance work. And so we expected Compose to get quite significantly better immediately following the 1.0. And so we basically set up a timeline that uh, allow or, or tried to project what Google would be working on and then, and then cut ourselves off after that. Because in reality, like if, if something hasn't improved, I don't, I don't want to publicly comment on, on the timeline. I'm not sure, sure if I'm yeah, allowed to. Not, not but our, our idea was that if, if Compose has not significantly improved in this amount of time, it's unlikely that there will be a step change in its performance in that amount of time plus three months. Mm -hmm. So if there is going to be a step change in performance that will just dramatically, dramatically move the needle overnight, we assume that it will happen relatively quickly after that 1.0 release when these engineers are finally able to kind of sit down and look at some performance optimizations. Mm -hmm. And that as it gets to steady state, we'll probably continue to see optimizations, but they won't be just this step change function of mm -hmm. all at once, yeah. like we got all the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to kind of capture that idea that we still think that there's a lot of low hanging fruit that they'll be able to just pluck off the tree pretty quickly. Um, and if that's not the case, and they really are fundamentally different from a performance standpoint, then we, we want to move forward and make sure that we're not stagnating. That's a pretty interesting challenge, again, because I, I know, like I've often said that, you know, it's always the best solution for you. but it's weird because now there's like a very large external factor that yeah. I mean it, it kind of feels it kind of feels like oh well you could just stay on views forever like not not really you can't um, especially with with the way that Google, the Google and the Play Store and everything are kind of tightening they're they're kind of tightening the the belt or tightening the restrictions on updates and and you kind of have to stay like a little bit more uh, up to date in terms of your software and your updates so you're kind of like all right, well, I guess we got to do this at some point. So it's, it's an it's interesting challenge, I think. Well, and it's worth saying that it's, it's not even a burden for us. Like, we're excited. Compose offers so much from a dev experience perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for every developer at Pinterest to have UI previews. And I'm excited for them to be writing in, in like, composable UIs with these reusable little components. And I'm mm -hmm. excited for them to be using UDF mm -hmm. and... All of that is exciting to me, and we want that to happen as soon as possible. Yeah. So I think for us, we are we're so ready to get to that point, and we really want to, mm -hmm. but we can't do so recklessly. And so we we have to also take care of the business and, and make sure that we're looking after our pinners and our users. And so for us, it's it's not like oh, at some point we'll have to adopt Compose. It's at some point we we get to, mm -hmm. and the question is just when can we make the business case strong enough that we can we can push across that line. But there's so much enthusiasm and. I think sometimes when people have heard that it, it didn't work out for us at this point in time, they assume like, oh, well, you're just not into Compose or you're, you don't particularly want to adopt it and nothing could be further from the truth. No, I, I think that's that's a really great point to make is that, you know, normally I think in a lot of spheres, early adopting is kind of not not a look down on. It's just more like it's risky. Mm -hmm. And and for some reason, it feels now that the story is like the, the, the mood or the vibe is a little switched. Like, oh, why aren't you on this train? I was like, no, no. You know what? What the decisions that you all are making are very sound, I think, engineering and business wise. But yeah. it's more just like it just just the story is a little bit different this time. And I, I like that kind of again dichotomy of you know you had a really great Kotlin story. The comp composer is a little more nuanced. Yeah. Um, just to end it on a positive note, and we can just like I don't know, is navel gaze the right term? But just kind of look speculatively. What what particular Jetpack Compose feature are you personally looking forward to actually getting to, do, to use? 
Honestly, um, this is this is kind of probably not the answer you're looking for. But the most exciting thing to me about Compose is that it encourages good data practices. And without a doubt, like Compose offers us so much. I, the APIs are great. Like it, it is so convenient. I've I've loved writing our UIs in Compose, but hands down the thing that I'm most excited for is that it is getting people to write their data flows in a way that is easier to understand, easier to debug, easier to trace. And as someone who is something of a data flow nerd and like who loves thinking about the way uh, logic occurs in applications, I am beyond thrilled that UDF is now a, a common pattern that everybody is talking about in large part because of Compose bringing it into mainstream conversation. No, I think that closes the loop just really well. I mean, I think that just goes to show that you've, I mean, again, I mentioned that that talk that I saw you do Kotlin on is Redux, which is in the same kind of family of data flow. And yes. obviously you at the time were very nerdy and very excited about <laughs> what, what you're talking of is like, and, and I, I actually think that data, the data story is really, really um, compelling. And I will already say it, like, I'll, I'll say that it has changed the way that I approach data. Um, and as universal data flow is getting more like hip and cool, what the cool kids are doing, yep. it makes sense for it to be integrated. So I love your answer, actually. And I think that that, no, but it's fair because Compose and, you know, declarative UI is the fancy, like, you know, makeup on the, well, not makeup, but like on the outside, yep. but then the data is like the yeah. the strong, I don't know, like the the good core, like core strength. I don't know. It's the part I love the most, hands <laughs> down. I, I love a good UI layer, but man, when when we're getting people to write data, data flows and, and their business logic in a way that's maintainable, chef's kiss. Love it. That's a really great uh, spot maybe to leave off on. Um, please watch Christina's talk for the entire story in which she goes through in a lot of really good detail about, you know, and uh, about kind of like all the considerations, all the thought that went through and all like the very hard work that you, you, you your team put in to try to adopt this. And I think having a story that encounter that actually is honest very honest, like awesomely honest about challenges and, and speaking and speaking very earnestly about, hey, sometimes things don't work out the way you want is is very compelling and obviously something that every engineer uh, should watch. And yeah, if people wanted to find you on the internet, Christina, how can they do that? To be honest, I don't think they can anymore. <laughs> that is okay. That is all right. I, uh, I do nominally have a Twitter account, but it is unmonitored. Mm -hmm. um, so I am... I guess people can find me in real life and, and say hi. And if they spot me at a conference, uh, feel free to come up and say hi, because hopefully I will be at more conferences in the future. I know I've taken a pause, but hoping to start up again. OK, well, no pressure. If you see Christina, um, I don't know, say hi. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for taking time to talk to me. Thank you, Wen. All right, and thank you all again, and we'll see you soon. Bye.